Hello, everyone. Welcome to Applied Anthroposophy, the first leading thoughts presentation with the Anthroposophical Society in America. I'm Laura Scappatici, the Director of Programs, and I'm joined here by some amazing colleagues and Reverend Patrick Kennedy. And we're so excited to have you here for our first leading thoughts, Patrick. Um, Patrick's the co-director of the Christian community in North America. If you don't want, know what the Christian community is, we can tell you all about that at some point. Um, but it was founded through Anthroposophy, and uh, that's what we're all here to talk about um, and to explore together. So if you're just coming in, uh, we have everybody muted now. We're going to have a chance to be in rooms and talk with each other later. Uh, but during Patrick's talk, we're going to keep the chat off. So if you're still coming in, let us know where you're from, but we're going to turn that chat off as soon as we turn over um, our time here to Patrick. So thanks for being here. And we're going to take a minute because we're using this uh, computer format to connect with each other. We're building our capacities to, to connect um, when we're not in the same space together. And uh, we're going to take a second right now just to get grounded. Um, someone told me, uh, Michelle, uh, she said to have some beeswax with you if that helps you ground. And we'll also just do this quick exercise, which is to notice the room you're in. So just take a look around at whatever room or space or car or wherever you are. And then take that out one layer and notice the structure you're in or the next biggest space. And then take that a little bit further into the town that you're in. And have a sense of that. And go a little bit further into the state or province or territory that you're in feel that and then out to the country that you're in right now we're in all different countries and then the continent you're on and then bring yourself right back into your feet and the seat that you're in right now and we'll be connecting through our eyes and our heart and with each other and I'm so happy and pleased to turn it over to Patrick Hey, Patrick. <laughs> and I think you just have to unmute and uh, there we go. Are you unmuted? There we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. It's a delight and joy as usual. Uh, our digital life together, Laura, began oh so many moons ago, it feels like now. And, and it took a pandemic for all of us to get on board somehow. Amazing. I certainly never would have gotten involved without your warm invitation. Uh, so thank you. Not now with this, I would have been glad to get involved. But back then, when it first came up, would you do a webinar without being able to actually be in the room together and sense each other? take questions and speak, all of that live, direct breathing back and forth, knowing as a kind of social event, that's how I work and love to work. And so to not be able to really sense who was in the room was daunting. So I, I hope I can a little bit sense you all and speak in such a way that you can through this screen, feel some of my humanity. So I'm here in Toronto, Ontario. I'm in the main classroom of the Seminary of the Christian Community, where I'm a co-director. I am not a director of the entire Christian community, as it sounded like I was from your uh, introduction, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> um, I actually work as a teacher and director at the Training for Priests. It is one of three seminaries in the world that is founded, you could say, the way Rudolf Steiner explained it was, anthroposophy is the teaching soul of the movement for religious renewal. The teaching soul. So although I am a Christian priest, I am also a member of the Anthroposophical Society and a member of the first class, the School for Spiritual Science. And those who are members of that school basically just say they are willing to serve 
and Theosophy in such a way that they want to represent her in the world through the way they are as people and through their understanding of what she is to bring to our time, to the needs of our age. And this society and this movement, the Anthroposophical movement, is for all of humanity, regardless of ethnic background, religious background, spiritual tradition, it is for all of humanity. So it is out of that that I'm coming to you tonight. I'm also what is called a Waldorf lifer. So if you've heard of Waldorf education, which sprang from anthroposophy, um, I attended these Waldorf schools. In fact, I got just about as many years as possible, three years of kindergarten. I'm one of those rare people, three years of kindergarten. But I did spend most of my sixth grade year in the public school in Sacramento, California, which was a very important year in my life. And then I went on to study cultural anthropology at the University of California in Santa Cruz. That's actually, I wanted to study physics and anthropology. But the physics department uh, turned me off, I'll just say that. But the anthropology department was very exciting. And that will actually touch in a little bit on some of our questions tonight. Because my question is, and was, who are we? What is the human being? Why are we here? And what are we to do in this world? And the fact that I had that question ought to strike us as familiar on the one hand and very strange on the other. I mean, really, really strange. What other creature is there in the world that wonders why it's here and what it's supposed to do? There is no tree you can come across, no small creature, no bird, no star in the sky or cloud, which is like, hey, wait a minute. Why am I blowing around through the air and raining down on people? Is this all I was meant for? We're these strange creatures in the whole universe that actually stop, step back, and end up in, a, in an existential crisis wondering, what is the purpose for being a human being? Where have I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? And that question actually reveals something extremely important about what it means to be a human being. The fact that we don't know what it means. The fact that we're wondering what it means. And human beings have wondered this question as, as a core question for thousands of years. What does it really mean to be a human being? And that is, you could say, the core foundational question also in the roots of what is called anthroposophy. It is finding a way to an answer that deeply satisfies that question. And tonight I was asked to speak about the question of freedom. The question of freedom in anthroposophy. And I'm just gonna write up on the board some of the levels that we'll look at tonight in the course of the presentation so that we can track together a little bit where we're going. So the first element connects with what I was just talking about, which is, I'll call it co the cosmological level. The fancy sounding word for the state of things, our condition. So freedom as actually, I'm going to write this in a different way. Oh, I'm all blurry.
So freedom as an existential state. Can you see that, Laura? It's a little blurry, isn't it, for some reason? There we go. Can you see that now a little bit better? For some reason, my camera is too smart. Freedom as an existential state. And this quality, what I want to talk about, has to do with this factor of us wondering about our nature, about our purpose, about the meaning of what it means to be a human being. The second level that we will look at tonight is <clears throat> freedom in the mind. Freedom in the mind. The third, freedom and creativity. And the fourth level, Freedom and action. So just another look at that if you're still writing it down. Freedom as an existential state, freedom in the mind, freedom and creativity, and freedom and action. So let's come back to this first layer. Freedom as an existential state. Just meditating on this experience that human beings actually don't just unfold who they are. We don't just live in deep satisfaction expressing who we are, the way in which, for example, the roses do outside our window here. There is no crisis of doubt in the life of a rose. It simply is a seed and hopes that the conditions are right and then it just unfolds its nature. So the inner lawfulnesses that guide its development are intimately united with its outer expression. I'm gonna say that again. The inner invisible lawfulness that guides its development are in harmony with its outer expression. Another way of saying that simply is a rose seed never goes up to be an oak tree. A rose seed never goes through a metamorphosis and becomes a beaver, right? The inner lawfulness that is an invisible law that guides everything in that rose's unfolding and how it responds and reacts to all the changing conditions is totally, completely bonded with the specific visible, physical rose. And all roses follow the same inner lawfulness. So in the language of anthroposophy, you would say the spirit of the rose is wholly united with the body of the rose. And the body of the rose and expresses the spirit of the rose. And you can do this experiment also with teenagers and kids. You can talk to them and you can say, so what is a horse made to do? And they know, they just like, no. Nobody's ever asked them. They know, run. Horses are made to run. Cows, not made to run. Now, cows can run and they can run fast. Definitely, no. Four stomachs and massive jaws with huge teeth that transform, they are made to chew, to ruminate, and deeply transform grass into milk. What about an eagle? Instantaneously, the kids know, soar. You just know it. 
But if you look at the body of a human being, right down into our body, we are a question mark. What is the human being made to do? Now in the animal kingdom, you can look and everything about their body tells the animal what it's made to do. It's also built into it. And if you do a deep morphological study, for example, of the bones, the hand bones can be found, for example, to exactly match the structural bones of the wings of a bird. So we always think of a bird as two-legged or only having two limbs, but actually the wings are its hands. So they're, they're folded up and the majority of the wing are really long fingers. So if you look at the bone morphology in birds, you will see those are their hands. And when your hands are wings and you look at them, you're like, I know what these are for. They're for flying. And you look at all through the animal kingdom again and again, you see and encounter the structure of the body of that animal tells us what it's to do. And it tells itself. It is wholly aligned with the inner lawfulness that guides its development, its spirit. Now, if you look at human beings, the whole way in which the structure of our human form has actually gone into the upright, which has incredible consequences, even just with our hip bones and what had to happen also, that actually gaining uprightness created pain in childbirth. It's directly related. This freedom of stature and freedom of limb cost us also suffering there. So now you look at these and you go, what are these made for? You look at your hand. Is there something very definite and specific that the morphology of the hand reveals these are definitely made for this? Now, most likely, we could sit here all day, actually, and write a list of things that the hand could do. And if you think like the way our natural scientists think, you would say, well, use tools. You can certainly say that's true, but that's just the beginning. What you see is also another way of saying is what actually are done with hands in the world? And if you answer that question, then what you find is beautiful things and terrible things. Creative, ingenious things and extraordinarily cruel and destructive things. You can put a hand on someone to bless them and comfort them or you can strike someone. Our hands are an open question. And what comes into the world through them, you could say they're kind of like, actually, if you observe, what is it that comes into the world through hands? It's the moral world. That is the world of good and evil, the world of the cruel, and the gentle and kind. A whole world that does not come into the world anywhere else. There is no cruelty, truly, in the other parts of the natural world. And the reason is, you also can never, if a lion escapes zoo, and we find that it goes and does something horrible, like eat a young child, and, which would be terrible, and maybe we would decide to kill the lion because it's too dangerous but we would never hold a trial for the lion. We would never want to have a process of justice to determine the motives for the lion. Was he acting in self-defense? It, it's not even a question. The lion was doing lion things. We don't hold it against the lion. It's made to hunt. We don't hold it against the line, but human beings, there we would have a trial because it's a question. 
Why did you do what you did? These are portals of moral forces into our world. And that is the great beauty and terrible responsibility of the fact of freedom. So freedom as a kind of cosmological fact. As beings, we wake up in a very body itself that demonstrates to us an open question. And so on the entire kind of cosmic body of the universe, if you imagine the entire universe as a tree, which is often done in the ancient wisdom traditions, there's a part of that tree that is undecided, that is the open growing point on the tree, where the whole rest of the tree, the whole rest of the cosmos is wondering, what will human beings become? They could go this way or that. And that experience of the state of our human experience, that you could call this kind of freedom as just a fact of our existential experience. However, however, that's not, the story that I just told you is not what is told to children and their science, science class. <laughs> Although that was born completely out of observation, I didn't add any kind of super sensible revelations there. That's just Eyes and ears can see all of that. Fee hearts can feel that. However, when we approach the world in a natural scientific way, we don't find freedom. In fact, what we find is everything is in the realm of cause and effect. This whole world is a great big clockwork. Ever since the Big Bang, it's been unfolding in a long series of causes and effects. And if you want to understand why I'm standing here in my little vest with my little tie, all you have to do is if you could possibly calculate all of the billiard balls that knocked me into this position. By billiard balls, I mean causes that go back to the original Big Bang. I am a random mutational accident in the great universe that happens to be standing here talking to you about morality. but I have no freedom actually. I'm actually just in a chain of cause and effect. And so the desire, for example, in physics to come up with a single math problem that could explain the universe is there. That's the feeling. If we could get to the right calculation with all the factors that are unknown included, we could come to a solution to the great world problem and we could calculate the rest of the events that will ever happen accounting for all kinds of multiple worlds and multiverses, but I won't go there. In any case, you get the idea. It was into that world that Rudolf Steiner was born. Rudolf Steiner appears kind of into the apex of that worldview coming to fruition, coming to flower. So we think of the middle of the 19th century, Darwin and Haeckel and uh, a, a, evolutionary explanation based on mutation and the survival of the fittest, of a Marxist historical explanation that the whole reason behind all of history, all culture, every artistic event, every temple, every creative endeavor, it's all explained by basically who has the power and who has the means of production and who's controlling those. It's a question of basically the base desires. And then Freud, same thing. There is nothing, anything that's up here is actually just surface level stuff in your mind. And what matters are deep desires that are totally selfish. So the vision of, of, of the world and humanity was, was not a hopeful one. And in philosophy, it was even worse. Basically, in the philosophy of science, which still to this day operates, which is what I encountered when I went to the University of California at Santa Cruz, there these brilliant minds would investigate and deconstruct every approach to knowledge and then they would say, there is no truth. Now, that sentence, of course, cancels itself out. It's a total statement about the nature of truth, a claim about, an absolute claim about truth saying there is no truth. So it cancels itself out, but that's besides the point. It was a feeling trying to investigate how can I know what is true? And I come to the edge and I have to say, I don't know. 
Maybe I'm just making it all up in my brain. Maybe my brain is just producing it as neurological events that is kind of like the software system that is operating up here. Meanwhile, the main systems are operating below, below deck. And that's what counts. And there you can see also computer consciousness is the next level. That was what also happened. Our consciousness is a screensaver to the actual ones and zeros of our computer system. All of this is to say, Rudolf Steiner experienced the free part of himself but deeply went into the science of his day to see, is it true? Are we truly free? Can I actually break through to an experience that I have the ability to experience the free part of myself and that I am not compelled by anything else? So now we're moving into the second level, freedom in the mind. The next level has to do not with something that's just kind of there as a kind of deep underground experience in our humanity and where these questions come up, but actually an active work to try to determine, am I free? Not somebody else saying, yes, of course you're free. No. Can I actually experience the free part of myself? What is that free part? So now I'm going to kind of color in some things behind me. So Basic to the anthroposophical cosmology that you also heard from Sherry Wilfoyer, you find something that corresponds with what the ancient wisdom also knew. That is a fourfold reality. And this ancient wisdom expressed it also in the nature of the four elements. And the most solid, most dense element in all of the cosmos is the earth element. And it is in the earth element that freedom comes into being. The next layer up, what was expressed in the natural world as water, can be expressed in the language of spiritual science as the life sphere, this fluid, living, spiritual, physical-like. It's not physical, it's just beyond the physical. It permeates all physical reality with its life forces, ordering and shaping all things, kind of like water permeates all things. That flowing, living force that's, that changes the state from what you could say the mineral kingdom moving up into the plant kingdom, the living realm, the life realm, where things come into being and die and reproduce and the whole life processes. Then in the third sphere, you could say the, the element of air in the air and the atmosphere in this unbelievable changeable element of the breath. There we have what is called in anthroposophical literature, the astral substance, the soul substance. And this is connected also with the ancient traditions that understood spirit as breath. Pneuma in Greek, spiritus in Latin, Ruach in Hebrew, the experience that once that air element enters into beings, they are ensouled. And you see that 
for example, in the plant kingdom, actually they don't have inner spaces most of the time. They build inner spaces in the flower area. And that's where they touch this sphere. But with animals, you suddenly have cavities, chests that can breathe in air and breathe out. The whole internal world, the air realm. And the last realm is fire. Revealed to us in the element of fire, And this is now a totally new kind of element because this is an element that is transformative of all the other elements. Now, of course, we could think wind and air and dirt can all put out a flame, but transformative means changing the state, which is an extraordinary capacity. So water can freeze and become an earth element. Water can get so warm, it can become a cloud. Fire is the force, heat is the force that changes and transforms the state of the life process. So this highest level of the element, fire is connected really with the creative spirit. So what we, what we think of in anthroposophy as spirit, the imagination of it in the elemental world would be fire. Back to Rudolf Steiner before the turn of the century. So basically from his birth, well, okay, that's a little unfair. Uh, maybe when he was, I don't know, very young, six, six years old. If you read his autobiography, he is wrestling with the question of what is the truth? How can I know the truth? How can I know what is hidden from me? How can I know it for myself? How can I show that the human being can know the truth and thereby become free? So he's 13 years old and he's in a really boring history class and he's sneaking copies of Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason in his desk and like reading the pages of this book, which if any of you have read is like so hard to read. It's painful, unbelievable, incredible, precise intellectual thinking of the 19th century, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. But it's a burning life question for him. Can I know the truth? I know this is wrong somewhere. And he's saying, I cannot, I cannot get beyond me to another. I cannot get outside of me to the true spirit of things. I'm stuck inside myself. In modern parlance, you would call that subjectivity. I'm stuck in myself. I, as a white man in Toronto, can never know what it feels like to be a black man in Kentucky and blocked off. If that's true, if that's true, can you imagine the hopeless state we're in? I've got to be able to find a way to understand and come across from where I am to understand the other. Otherwise, there isn't hope. These have unbelievable dimensions of consequence. It's not an abstract question about knowledge. It is about the future of our human community. And Rudolf Steiner felt that. Also in terms of the future of being able to access the spirit. Because also the churches of his day said, you also cannot access the spirit. All that revelation is done. No one can access it anew. It's done. So science and the church were saying, you can't get to the truth. And he burned with a passion to try to break through to that experience. And that was work, not opinion. So you could say the whole first part of Rudolf Steiner's work up until 1899 was, can I turn my consciousness into a laboratory? And there within my mind, so observe my conscious activity of knowing that I discover the flame in me. That was Rudolf Steiner's breakthrough. 
his breakthrough was to move from this world of cause and effect up to that part within him that was flame. And as a song from, I believe it was the late 80s or early 90s said, free your mind and the rest will follow. You see, that was his experience. So he wrote this unbelievable book that has two halves to it called The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. That's the title he wanted to give it for us, us Westerners rather than the philosophy of freedom because it's about the activity of your mind. The activity. The activity. Not the passivity. Because when you experience the living, free, active part of you to such an intensity as he did, what he found was even when his body fell asleep, he stayed awake. That was the radical experience. To so strengthen that free part within him, it could be free of the body. Now that's, of course, where we begin to touch, you know, the, the crazy part to anthroposophy. But don't worry, anthroposophy is totally crazy. If it ever wants to try to be normal, it can quit now. We talk about fairies and elemental beings and, and hierarchies and all kinds of things. So we can't pretend that we're going to be normal and acceptable to the worldview that we currently operate in. But it's also nothing new. It's nothing new that someone would have an out-of-body experience, except the difference was it wasn't instigated by an event from outside. It wasn't an accident where he was outside of the body. It wasn't drugs that he took, which changed his consciousness so he was outside of the body. It was his own effort. What awoke inside him then was the experience of the totally free part of himself. So that was a breakthrough in Rudolf Steiner to the experience of freedom. And what do you experience there? It's in that sphere <clears throat> that you also now have access to those inner lawfulnesses that are invisibly working in all things. Let's say that again. What happens is I've broken through in that moment to the part of me that is my own spiritual lawfulness. that part in me can see the spiritual lawfulness of all things. Another way of saying it is, I have a physical body with physical eyes. These eyes reveal to me the physical world. When I awaken my spirit self, the spirit in me sees the spirit in the world. It's an organ of perception. Our body is an organ of perception. That's what it is. It perceives 12 gates, 12 senses in anthroposophy, 12 gates to the rest of physical reality. But my life body has gates, my soul body has gates, and my spirit all have gates to those worlds. So why that was so important was now it was not tradition. Now it wasn't revelation from the past. It was a scientific effort within the laboratory. You could say the, the, the scientist had a breakthrough. <laughs> and what he was a scientist of was cognition, of knowing and a science of the human self. And what he broke through was from a self that is compelled by all of these things that operate in the world of the clockwork universe to the free part of himself. In the ancient traditions, you would say he's also starting to see the logos reality that is permeating all of physical reality. So the freedom breakthrough in the mind was that experience of seeing the inner architecture of all reality. So those of you who are familiar with the Matrix trilogy, that was what they were trying to depict. The first initiation moment was that Neo, the person who goes through these experiences, starts to see the hidden code, the hidden spiritual architecture, but not spiritual, digital architecture, that is at work in this matrix, this virtual reality he's walking around in. He sees through the images to the code. 
Then he wakes up into physical reality. And then in the third film, he has a higher awakening and he sees a golden code at work in the physical reality. And he's physically blind. And there they wanted to show us there's a next layer that a person can be initiated into which sees the inner code, the logos at work in the physical cosmos. Once Rudolf Steiner broke through to that level, then after 1899, he could also, once he found some people who wanted to hear about his research, he could share what he was finding. So when we look for an answer right now, we go to the Google machine, right? And the Google machine, we type this thing in our computer and it sends out a request and it goes through a digital network that becomes actually that goes into the cloud, it goes up into the cloud of computers, which is the mind, this, this digital mind surrounding the earth in search of the answer. And you'd think you'd have to wait a while, <laughs> right? Like, okay, when is, no, it's like, boom. Because across that electrical light, information can travel with unbelievable speed. That is a subnatural picture of the spiritual reality. So if you're a spiritual researcher, you're bringing your question not to the Google machine, but you're bringing it to the living field of spiritual thoughts that permeate reality. And then you can begin to understand how it is that this one human being wrote 30 books and gave 6,000 lectures on every possible topic you could ever imagine with authority. Now, he had a really big library. <laughs> but that is not the only place that he got his information because most of the stuff that he gave can't be found in the usual library. So he had a breakthrough in this freedom in the mind. And what happens there is immediately you experience this part is the creator part. It's the generative part. Someone who is free, a being who is free, is not compelled by anything to do anything. Totally free then the choices that being makes are generative, creative. They actually bring things into being. And again, you just, if you just look at Rudolf Steiner's life, again, what he accomplished from 1899 to 1925 when he died, it's just mind boggling, regardless of what you may think of him. Try writing four dramatic plays with unbelievable number of characters including spiritual beings that go over multiple incarnations. If I, in my lifetime, could write four plays that involved all of those things in mantric quality of verse, I would die thinking I'd done something in this life. That happened in four years of his life during a few, like a month of that year. unbelievable creative energy was unleashed in creativity and the arts. So the whole first section of Rudolf Steiner's working from basically 1900 until 1908, 1901 to 1908, you could count from 1902 when he became the general secretary for the Theosophical Society until the Munich conference of 1907. Suddenly the arts start to come, painting, theater, Eurythmy is born eventually, the calendar of the soul and these verses of living of the, of the heart with the world. And in 1913, the foundation stone laid for what would become the first Gertiana, an unbelievable culmination of the arts. So this creative artistic element is born and launched in the middle of his working. And then what is in the third? The third part of the work that starts to happen is all of this creativity ultimately touches down in how we live together in our human society. What are the institutions? What are the cultural um, creative 
efforts that we make in our education, in our agriculture, in medicine, in religious life, in architecture and the arts, all of the initiatives that have to do with culture and the changing of human culture that can become spirit imbued emerge in the third and final phase. Because the last, the last level, the spirit that is found beyond the body, free from all influence from the outside, longs to then unfold itself in a body. It longs to manifest itself, just like this spirit of the rose only feels fulfilled when it can unfold itself in the physical rose, manifest itself. And that creative unfolding into action is that final phase. And that's where we come to the last part of the talk, which is the title of the talk. So if I have, if you've been wondering, when are you ever gonna get to the title of the talk? So you can see that in the first part, there is this individual effort to give birth to freedom in one's own consciousness. That gives birth and rise to creative efforts which begins a whole community process as well. And the final stage is this responsibility to one another. What happens is if you know that the whole hope of the human being is to unlock that free flame within, then the thought of ever being controlling in any way of another human being is an absolute abomination. It's, it's like a horrific thought. And I'll, I'll close with the kind of picture that comes that we can understand this, you could say, as a, a, a an, an event in the history of humanity. In all of the ancient cultures, if with the, the remnants that we have, you, you find evidence of a spiritual worldview that experienced the divine creative power is at home in the whole universe. And you could say the universe itself and all its stars, moon, and sun, and earth is the temple of God. The divinity is expressed in the physical temple. It lives and dwells there. That faded over time, has been fading. And suddenly then you start to see community-sized temples being built. Think of Stonehenge. Think of places in South America, North America, the pyramids, the, the places, for example, of the ziggurat in Babylonia. Suddenly temples were being built that were in alignment with the starry world, but where the experience was, in the center of the temple, the divinity lives. So you think of, for example, the Hebrew people, they had a temple, and it had four chambers, an outermost chamber, the next chamber with the, where it was still open to the sky above, but there was a door you had to go through. Now you get to an inner chamber that's still large where there are altars and candles and inner space. Many priests could go in there in the Temple of Solomon. And there's a last chamber, and that chamber is the Holy of Holies. It's totally dark. And only one person can go in there at one time in the year, the high priest, and there say the name of God. The name of God in the Hebrew tradition is I am. And in, in hearing that, we hear something of the idea of the human being coming from out of the cosmos, down into the community, living in outer bigger temples until finally, actually the event of Jesus of Nazareth inhabited by a divine creative power known as the Christ. For, the, for spiritual science, it's not a 
religious confessional thing. It's an event in the story of the great temple story to come to the day when now actually the divinity can dwell in every single human heart. The body becomes a temple and the divine creator can awaken in the holy of holies. And when that gets unleashed, the creative powers of each individual can come into the world that, and only through them can the solutions to our issues be solved. So a person who lives with this consciousness feels impelled to approach each human being as a sacred temple. And what lives inside their heart, no matter what they think, no matter what their impulses are, is holy and inviolable. The freedom of the other must be guarded and protected. And that becomes a new foundation actually for social life. When I awaken the inner spirit fire of my humanity, I only feel the deepest concern to serve and support the unfolding of the flames in all of my brothers and sisters. That is what I wanted to try to bring tonight in general as this picture of a little bit of a taste and flavor of the way in which freedom lives in anthroposophy. Another way of saying it, to stir your reflection, I'll leave with you, is that anthroposophy begins as a science. It deepens as an art and culminates in religion. Now I can already hear the groans in the room. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. Not as religion as we've understood it, but actually as the moral field of encounter. That actually every encounter with every human being, with every plant, with the earth herself, can become a sacred encounter. Thank you very much for your attention and time, and I'm glad I was able to try to bring something of this to you. It was a joy. We're just going to have a quick, quiet moment. Thank you, Patrick, and then we'll go into our next thing. So we'll just be quiet for a minute. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you for using this beautiful illustration on the board that we can all see. And wow, so I think we'll, we can just, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'm sure people are taking screenshots of that as we sit here <laughs> together. Thank you so much. And so we have a next activity we'd like to do with everybody. And um, I think, Tess, you can open the chat back up. So Patrick, what we're gonna do now is um, just turn it over to Chris Burke because as you know, this whole course is grounded in current events, which you touched on um, throughout and also biography work. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Burke and um, he's going to take us into our next activity and then we're gonna come back um, with questions for you. So if everybody can just hang on, thank you so much. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so as Laura said, my, my name is Chris Burke, and I'm going to be leading us in a little biographical exercise. Um, and we'll, we'll do one of these after each of the leading thoughts lectures. And um, uh, so I want to start just by telling you a little bit about biography work. So Laura or Tess, whoever has the slides, if you could put them up for slide, that would be great.
Right. So some of you may have uh, may have encountered biography work, may have done some biography work at some point in your life. Um, we don't have a lot of time to work here, so I just want to briefly just touch on what is biography work. Um, it's something that comes out of anthroposophy, something that comes out of the picture of the developing human being um, that we study in anthroposophy. And, um, you know, I, I could say that biography work is really about exploring your life story, uh, the events of your life through different lenses, learning to see it as a coherent whole, um, really trying to take a step back from the the day-to-day -day grind of your life and the um, the way that you feel about all of the things that are happening to you every day and, and to see it as a whole picture. Um, that's what we do in biography work. Um, a lot of the way that we do that work is by learning to listen at a deeper level than we may be used to. Um, and biography work often involves a lot of uh, sharing, sharing life stories with each other. And so when other, someone else is speaking, we'll practice listening deeply to others, but also practice listening deeply to what your life is trying to speak to you. So what is it that your life is trying to say? And, you know, I think Patrick touched on some of these themes um, as well. You know, there's this, something is trying to come through me and how can I connect with that, uh, that what is trying to come through me? And, um, you know, and we also heard in Patrick's lecture about um, this, you know, this strange human being who has the capacity to be anything they want to be, who has this infinite potential. Um, so there's something about each of us that is universal, that, that reflects this kind of archetypal pattern of human development. Um, but there's also a part that is, is totally unique to you. And so biography work is about finding those, those lines. All right, next slide, please. So whenever we do this kind of sharing, it's important to have a little bit of uh, ground rules established. And uh, for those in the chrysalis groups who uh, met earlier, heard, they heard some of this. Um, but uh, you know what we're gonna be doing here is sharing stories with each other. And it's important to always recognize that you maintain control over what you share and how much you share whenever you're talking about an, an experience in your life. Don't share any more than it's comfortable for you. Um, but but you know, feel free to participate wholeheartedly. Um, when it's your turn to speak, generally speaking, we'll be taking turns speaking. So one person will have an opportunity to speak for a couple of minutes. When it's your turn to listen, offer the other people, the other person who's speaking, the gift of quiet, non-judgmental listening. Just open your heart to whatever it is they have to offer. And, um, and it's not a conversation. It's not, you're not going to respond. It's really just taking it in. Um, third, we're going to learn to respect silence as a source of deep wisdom. So um, sometimes when you can find the sort of quiet stillness on the surface of the pond, you can see down, right down through to the bottom. Um, you know, so when we find that place of quiet, sometimes things can come through. Uh, and then fourth, the ability for others to share freely really depends on the trust, their trust that their stories are going to be held with confidentiality. So um, if you don't know whether somebody is going to repeat your story, you're probably not going to share it. So, um, so when someone shares a story in, in uh, the context of one of these exercises, um, just hold that story as something sacred. All right. So with those, that sort of introduction in place, let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so we'll be putting you into groups of four and uh, you'll have an opportunity to share for two minutes each. And uh, in the interest of, you know, respecting silence, we'll, we'll let you know when it's time to, to switch speakers. So, you know, if it's your turn to speak and your two minutes isn't elapsed, it's okay. Just, we can just be quiet for, for the, the last 30 seconds. We'll, we'll give you a cue when it's time to switch speakers. Um, and, you know, you'll also learn to experience that the silence is not a comfortable feeling. We, we like it when the space is filled. But just wait for our cue and, and it, all, all, it will all be good. Um, and the question that we'd like you to explore is, is to think back to a time in your life when you felt like someone or something outside of you hindered your freedom, right? Something was standing in the way of your ability to, to act freely. And the question is, you know, uh, Patrick touched on this too. Can you find something within you that remained free in that moment, right? So, so the sharing that you'll do is um, to set up that situation, describe something about that situation, and then just ask yourself, was there something in you that was able to remain free in that moment? Was there something in you that, that was still free in spite of that experience of unfreeness? All right, clear enough? 
So again, we'll put you into uh, breakout groups of four and uh, you'll have two minutes each to share. And then uh, we'll come back and give you a chance to share some of your reflections in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna open all the rooms. Please accept the invitation and uh, we'll, we'll help you with the timing and we'll all be back here to reflect and ask any questions and open the space. So please just accept the invitation as you come in, as you see it show up. Okay, there we go. Good job, everybody. You're doing it. Experience or anything that you learned um, in that, in that uh, um, sharing, in that reflection. Uh, it's just very grounding. And there are many levels of freedom, Patrick. That's what um, we're hearing here. And the chat's open to everybody. <laughs> um, it was a realization that happened in, the, in that group space. So thanks for creating that, Chris. Mm. And I think everybody can read these. Courageousness is necessary for felt freedom. And we seem to create a lack of freeness. Um, people are being very open in the groups. That's very nice. Um, Mm hmm. If you've had controlling experiences, you might want to create more freedom. They're saying that's a reflection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spirit is always free, maybe more restricted in the body and but spirit is free. Um, mm -hmm. This question about what is freedom came in there too. Deep listening is a yeah. As I was warm, a feeling of, as being heard. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Chris, and then. Yeah, well, I, thank you all for, for that, uh, for that time and for the sharing. And uh, we'll now uh, turn it over to Patrick to answer a few questions. Mm -hmm. So Patrick, if, if anyone has, Question specifically for Patrick, if you could go ahead and type them in the chat, that'd be great. And um, we'll try to capture these too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some great questions. So if they're specifically for Patrick, maybe just type Patrick and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, and Patrick, maybe you have some closing um, reflections too. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's definitely a theme going here about um, freedom impinging on someone else's one one person's freedom impinging on somebody else's freedom and this comment that freedom for a person in a white body and in a black body are different um so there's these you know layers of freedom and things that are going on here yeah yeah the examples i think the some of the strongest examples we have of i think you could, or let's let's say this way what does freedom look like and one of the big trajectories that we've been on over the past hundreds of years has been to realize outer, outer freedom for all people. That's like a first work. And there have been many um, members of our human family who have been less free outwardly than others. And there have been social systems in place to benefit one group over the, at the expense of another. And a lot of the social movements of our time, you could say, are feeling the fire inside their beings, the burning flame that says, there must be freedom. And so the social movements, where do, where do they emerge? They emerge because there's an actual spiritual event taking place, lighting up within human beings. I mean, it's a crazy thought, but about 100 years ago, women couldn't vote in the United States of America. Like that's right. That was imagine. Imagine we were to meet somebody today. It's like you know, women should definitely not vote. They're too hysterical. Uh, they can't think straight. If someone were to say that, we would think they're crazy. A hundred years ago, it was law. Like it, and and you know, my my dear dear friend and brother in the work, uh, Paul K. Chappelle. He talked about, well, who was involved in changing that law? 
how many Americans were involved in change in the suffragette movement, changing the law? One percent worked actively to get women to vote. One percent. Like that, like that's so small. <laughs> But that effort of that tiny amount of people with that deep conviction and willingness to sacrifice, see fire is always connected to sacrifice, willing to put their lives on the line, that went to jail, that were um, beaten and often faced life-threatening things to make that happen. That's freedom in action. When you overcome every threat to compel you, for a truth that you believe in and are ready to die for. That's the way Martin Luther King Jr. described it. Until you've found something you are ready to die for, you're not yet truly fit to live. That's a strong word. But that's because you feel in that moment your true freedom. Because once I become ready to die for something, you don't have power over me. So if you want to see an image of freedom, look up Woolworth's Counter 1963. Woolworth's Counter 1963. An image of young people being humiliated by a, a white mob. Two black three black students and one white professor from their college sit down at the Woolworth's Counter and know this is going to break up and challenge an existing system that is oppressive of the freedom of individuals. But if, as you all know, we were to break through all of that and change everything so that no one was any longer outwardly unfree, would freedom be done? Quite the contrary. Some of the freest events that you see are someone like Nelson Mandela who gets offered outward freedom if he will not work against apartheid and chooses jail, right? Do you see how this flips everything? He reveals what freedom looks like by going willingly into jail. <laughs> when I can actually choose to risk my life, to that is overcome the most powerful force in, in me, which is self-preservation for an ideal, for my brothers and sisters. That is freedom in action. And that touches all of us. That touches all of us. No one is outside of that question, but anyone who would compel me to be loving, because that's actually what this is about, love. Freedom is the womb in which love can be born. And anyone who tries to compel me or any other person to be loving is now a tyrant. Love is so radical, freedom is so radical for love to happen, I have to allow you space to reject me and inwardly hate me. But I won't allow you to enact laws or actions that threaten others. I have to draw a line somewhere. And that's where we draw that line is in relationship to each other's bodies. So freedom is so radical because it believes deeply, deeply in the possibility of love. And only if I let you go and be free do I give you the possibility of loving me. I can never make you love me. I wish it were different. <laughs> Feels great to be loved. <laughs> but every time I've tried that is seriously backfired. <laughs> so that's just, it's kind of the inner law of love. It requires a field of freedom. And that's the crazy dynamic of our age. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And thank you so much, Patrick, for your beautiful words and the way that you brought us together to work with these concepts. And um, 
we'll be talking about freedom for the next three sessions after this one. And then our next theme is love. So um, we're, we're in that womb space of freedom right now, figuring that out. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we'll just unmute everybody and they can, we can all say goodbye to each other. And then Tess and I are gonna hang out after and answer any questions for people that are in the program. If you have specific questions about the program, we'll be here for a little bit. But uh, let's just unmute and sing here. And uh, we're saving your questions too. And we'll have a board that you can post your thoughts on freedom. Um, so look for all that stuff in, in email tomorrow. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, everybody.